You know, the other day I was having a conversation with somebody and they asked my opinion about the best way to lose weight. And I'm not sure what it is about this particular topic where everybody thinks that it's about an opinion rather than science. The reality is if you want to lose body fat, gain muscle, live the life that you're looking for, there is a science to this. And we're going to teach you how today. Welcome to the Evolve Podcast, a podcast about disrupting your life to spark new evolution. Evolve your body, evolve your mind, evolve your soul, and evolve your tribe. And now it's time to disrupt. And with that, folks, we want to welcome you to another episode of the Evolve Podcast. Joining me in his home in balmy Oberlin, Ohio, <laughs> my co-host, W. Miles Riley. Welcome, Miles. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. It's good to be here. Nice and warm in the middle of the winter in Oberlin, Ohio, and somewhere in the mountains of Utah, I am Steve Cutler. Uh, hey, guys, we are really excited today to be joined by Tanya Halliday. Uh, Tanya, or excuse me, Tanya is a assistant professor at the University of Utah, go Utes, in the Department of Health and Kinesiology, where she conducts research related to weight management and appetite regulation. Halliday is also a registered dietitian and has a background in sports nutrition and obesity medicine. She became interested in research while an undergraduate nutrition major and student athlete at the University of Wyoming. We won't talk about that part. Initially, her interests were related to nutrition and athletic performance, but they expanded to a focus on how lifestyle interventions can be utilized to prevent and treat obesity-related comorbidities. Following her dietetic internship at the University of Houston, Tanya completed her PhD in clinical physiology and metabolism at Virginia Tech, and then went on to train as a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Colorado's, I'm going to butcher this one, Anschutz, is that right, Tanya? Yeah, right on, Anschutz Medical Center. All right, hey, there we go, Anschutz Medical Campus. She moved to Salt Lake City to begin working at the U in 2018 and has fallen in love with all the outdoor recreation opportunities available in the Wasatch. Tanya grew up in a small town outside of Boston, Massachusetts, but fell in love with the Rocky Mountains and the West during a family vacation to a horse ranch in Wyoming in, the mid in middle school. She grew up playing soccer, which eventually transitioned into playing for the University of Wyoming, working as a ski instructor at a small mountain in New Hampshire and horseback riding. After her soccer career ended, Tanya fell in love with trail running, outdoor adventures, and weightlifting. She has competed in a few marathons, including Boston in 2021, where she raised money for the Cam Neely Cancer Foundation and complete, competed in a bodybuilding show in the figure division. More recently, Halliday has developed a passion for reformer Pilates and currently teaches one day a week at Rocksteady Body Works in Holiday, Utah. Tanya is passionate about advocating for cancer research and support for those going through cancer treatment. In 2018, her younger sister Jessica was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, and despite being an absolute fighter, unfortunately passed away in October 2021. When Jess was diagnosed, she and Tanya started Buck Off Cancer, a play on the words and a nod to Jess's dedication to a career as an equestrian, which is now a 5013C nonprofit. Tanya Halliday, thank you for joining us and welcome to the Evolve Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. What a cool background you have. I mean, um, everything from hiking, trail running, playing soccer, uh, playing for that school that we used to compete against uh, yeah. up north. And, uh, and now you're at the right school, the University of Utah. So tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. What does your bio not tell us? You know, I think I included a lot of things in there, but um, what I didn't include is that um, I have three dogs and it's a little bit chaotic in our house Wow! and we're currently doing a, a remodel. So we're without a kitchen. Um, and so I will say as a registered dietitian right now, my diet is not so great because <laughs> we are got a 
some things in the fridge, but, uh, you know, takeout and uh, some like microwave meals right now are what we're getting by on. In there you go. Shape. Taco Bell and lean cuisine is what I'm hearing here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Tanya, what, what is it that you feel like you are the best in the world at? You've got a lot of things going on, but what, what's your uh, main thing? Well, I'm definitely not the best in the world at anything. Um, but my research is really focused on, uh, weight management and appetite regulation, um, and particularly using lifestyle interventions. So different diet and exercise techniques. And so I think that's where most of my expertise lies, but there are a lot of people who are a lot better than me who do it too. Uh, very humble of you. Thank you. Um, how Talk a little bit about how you invo evolved into this version of yourself. What does that path look like for you personally? Yeah, so as, um, as you sort of read in my bio, my background was really initially I was interested in sports nutrition and that really just came about because I was a student athlete myself and wanted to figure out how I could optimize performance. Um, then I realized, you know, as you sort of transition away from being a college athlete where you are told what to go do and when to go do it in terms of your workouts, and then all of a sudden you're in the real world and you have to figure out your diet and your exercise on your own, uh, it really was eye-opening of, uh, wow, you know, there's a lot of things that impact people's ability to engage in these behaviors and manage their weight when they're dealing with life. Mm -hmm. Um, that you don't really know when you're, you know, 20 something know it all. Um, and yeah, those so I transition think, and, of periods are really tough for people, aren't they? Yeah, they really are. Um, and I hope someday, you know, my research can, uh, you know, get into helping those student athletes transition to kind of living healthier lives. Um, been submitting a couple of grants in that direction, but so far have not had them funded. Um, but yeah, and I think, you know, when you kind of look at it, particularly in the U.S. and other westernized countries, a, a lot of our disease burden does come from excess adiposity um, and poor diet and inactivity. And so when you're looking about, you know, where I can make an impact on a bigger scale, it really is in those areas versus, you know, helping an athlete get just a little bit faster. And while that's important for them, you know, on, on a broader impact for population health, um, that's not going to move the needle. Yeah. And really this epidemic of obesity has been skyrocketing. I mean, we have seen this massive increase, almost a J curve uh, level where we've uh, just continued to become more and more overweight and obese over the past five, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, I've been in health and fitness for over 20 years and it's shocking to me how much speed we have picked up in the last really five years. I think the pandemic pushed us forward. Um, it, there, there's a lot of challenges that come with being overweight and with being obese as a society, not just individually, but our overall medical costs have gone up significantly. So I love how you talked about that you feel like you can make a bigger impact by focusing on this particular problem rather than just getting a few uh, milliseconds off of somebody's time if they're a, a student athlete. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your research. I know your research focuses on weight management and appetite regulation. Um, what is something that you learned recently that's fascinated you? Yeah, recently um, we conducted a study where we were looking at resistance exercise compared to aerobic exercise and how that impacts some of our, these gut hormones. Um, so hormones oh, that are produced in our gastrointestinal tract that are play a role in hunger and satiety. Um, and a lot of the research that had been done previously looking at exercise and appetite regulation had really focused on aerobic exercise. And I, you know, I had that little stint as a bodybuilder. So I'm always thinking, what about resistance exercise? Yeah, um, because yeah. that's generally understudied. And as a population, we don't engage in it as much um, as we do aerobic exercise, although we're certainly lacking nationally there as well. Um, and so we conducted a study to directly compare a bout of resistance exercise to a bout of aerobic exercise. And we also compared it to a sedentary control condition. And what we found that was interesting was that a hormone called ghrelin, which is produced in the stomach and uh, plays a role in signaling increased hunger, was actually reduced more in the resistance group than in the aerobic exercise group. But then when we looked at two different hormones that are involved in satiety, um, PYY and GLP-1, 
those were higher in the aerobic exercise group. So it seemed that both types of exercise actually do have some type of appetite inhibiting effect, um, but resistance exercise maybe seems to potentially it will de decrease hunger, whereas aerobic exercise may actually help increase satiation. Um, and so that was really interesting for us to see, um, not only to look at the differences between the types of exercise, but also there's uh, this mentality out there that exercise or some people think that exercise is pretty useless for weight management because it's just going to drive your appetite up and make you overeat. Um, and we've shown that's not necessarily the case, actually. Yeah, it's more psychological from my experience. And I that, that's fascinating to me about the changes in ghrelin. It doesn't surprise me because I found over the years that strength training was something that I felt like was more of an appetite uh, suppression, whereas cardiovascular exercise, when I do more of that, I tend to feel more hungry. I'd talk a little bit more about this. You said PYY and GLP-1 yes. was released higher. I, so I'm not I'm not as familiar with those. I'm not, I understand ghrelin and leptin, but not these other two. Can you talk a little bit about how that functions inside of the body? Yeah, so those both are going to be released also from the gastrointestinal tract, and they will signal up to the brain to help um, inhibit food intake. Um, so okay. they are... Uh, uh, they're appetite suppressing, but it's more that they're uh, informing your brain that you're satiated, that you've consumed enough. Um, and, and that's part of, well, obviously, you know, exercise or, you know, anything that you eat is not going to have the same effect on those hormones as say like a drug will. The recent obesity um, drugs that have been shown to be really effective are GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, and so they're acting by some of those similar pathways. And of course, at pharmacological doses, you would get a much greater effect on that appetite um, suppression. But the gist of it is essentially, whether you're doing strength and resistance training or you're doing cardiovascular training, you're still gonna have some sort of appetite uh, suppression. Yep. Yep. Definitely compared to just, you know, sitting there doing nothing. Um, there is going to be, a, at least on the acute level, um, a little bit of that appetite suppression happening. Um, now it gets a little more complicated when we go out. So this was just an acute study. We looked at a single bout of exercise, gave a test sure. email and saw what happened. Um, when we go out to 12 week interventions, then it gets a little bit more complicated because you're also dealing with changes to body composition, which could also impact mm -hmm some of those changes in those appetite hormones. Um, for instance, we had done a study when I was a postdoc at Colorado where we compared matched weight loss between diet and people who underwent bariatric surgery. And oh, interesting. the diet, yeah, the diet induced weight loss they had, um, you know, they, their responses were much different. Obviously when you're rearranging your gastrointestinal tract, things happen that are much different. Um, but they did not have some of these changes that we would expect that would promote weight regain. Whereas the people who lost weight through the diet intervention, um, they were seeing, um, increases in ghrelin and decreases in these satiety hormones. And so that seems to be playing a role potentially in why people regain weight after they lose weight. And why, when you look at surgical interventions, long-term people are more successful at maintaining weight loss than when they just do it by diet alone. And so we think that, so you, yeah, ahead, so we can think that by adding exercise, that can be a way to help maintain that weight loss, not only because you're increasing your energy expenditure, but also because maybe you're impacting some of these gut hormones that will suppress appetite a little bit more and not uh, encourage your body to overeat, to consume, to, you know, regain weight. Yeah, that's fascinating. So talk a little bit about that. Cause I know that one of the, the biggest challenges people have is just they, they go on a diet and maybe they're going on a diet and exercise program, they lose weight. Um, it's really common for them to overeat and then gain the weight back and potentially more depending on what the body composition looked like, right? If I've lost this, uh, some muscle, then metabolically, I might be different at this lower weight than what I was before. Um, talk a little bit about those, the, the challenges that people have when it comes to regaining that weight after they've lost it. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think, and that's an area that my lab's uh, currently focused on uh, as well as uh, preventing weight regain following weight loss, because you're right, that is the bigger issue. I mean, not that it's easy to lose weight, but we can lose weight variety of means and people have been successful, but the regain is incredibly common. 
Um, and there's a few things that are happening there. Um, one, from a psychological standpoint, when you're in a weight loss phase and you're, you know, tracking your weight, probably, you know, at least weekly, if not more regularly, you're engaging in these, you know, dieting and exercise behaviors to elicit a caloric deficit. And you're seeing your results on the scale. Yeah. You know, you're seeing that weight drop. You're seeing the changes to your body in the mirror. You're feeling your clothes fit different. Maybe you're buying new clothes. And so there's a more of a reward there for engaging in those behaviors. At some point, you know, you need to focus and shift to maintaining that weight loss. And now you're engaging in these same behaviors, but you're doing it to maintain that. And that may not be as rewarding from a psychological standpoint, potentially. And so that could be one of the things is that you're doing all of these same activities, but nothing's happening on the scale. And typically at that that point, people are still trying to lose more weight. And if you were working with a client one-on-one, -on -one, you'd probably be at the point where you say, you know, you've lost a significant amount of weight. You've seen all these improvements in your health. You've seen these improvements in your physical performance. You've said your quality of life is better. Um, maybe you're not where you were in high school, but you're in a really good point. Maybe we should shift that focus to maintenance. Um, and so I think people get a little discouraged at that point as well. The other thing is that our bodies really want us to go back to that status quo, um, to increase our weight kind of back to where we were to that stable or more set point. And yeah. so we're also fighting against our physiology and our biology at that point as well. Um, and the third thing is our environment is really not helpful in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah. you know, think about, <laughs> you know, we're very car centric, especially here in the U S um, hardly anyone is, you know, commuting to work like they might be in more European cities. And, uh, you know, our, a lot of our social events are around food, restaurants, so have big portions. And so you kind of got this trifecta of things that are working against you um, to maintain that weight loss. So you've got a little bit of the psychology, you've got some physiology, and then you have some lifestyle factors. I want to come back to the psychology piece, because I, I agree with you. I think that's a major piece uh, that people run into. If I have a goal, and I'm focused on that goal, I'm tracking towards that goal. And there is almost like this consistent dopamine, uh, dopaminergic response of like, hey, I'm achieving these things. And so I get these little hits and these little rewards uh, that I'm seeing the weight loss, or maybe I'm seeing a little bit more definition, or I can fit into different clothes. Um, what, what are some suggestions that you would have for people if they're transitioning from a weight loss to some sort of maintenance? How, how do people psychologically make that shift and create whether it's a reward system or like, wh what do you what do you tell people to do? Yeah, I, that's, that's spot on is they need something else. And so I think there it's where your goals need to shift to something else besides a weight based outcome. So maybe, you know, if you're mountain biking, for instance, your goal is to, you know, do some summer mountain bike series um, consistently. And then once you've sort of gotten into that, maybe your goal is to get faster, to get on the podium for your age group, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Um, and so those sorts of goals that then you shift back to being, being a little bit more performance focused than, than weight centric. Um, the other thing we're currently have a study where we're utilizing a mindfulness um, and cognitive reappraisal intervention to specifically help uh, with this maintenance phase. And it's still really early days, so we don't have any results. Um, but uh, I'm working with another faculty member at the University of Utah who had developed a program that uh, he calls Mindfulness Oriented Recovery Enhancement or more. And it was developed actually in the context of um, like drug and alcohol misuse disorders. And when we okay. look at the literature in general, where mindfulness interventions seem to be most effective is in these maintenance phases and in preventing relapse. Um, and so my thought is, well, if we view obesity as a chronic disease, then weight regain is really just relapse. And so maybe we need to be doing something differently in this relapse or in this uh, maintenance phase to prevent relapse. And so the program that we're uh, trialing right now, it's an eight week intervention. And so we recruit people who have already lost weight either um, on their own with diet and exercise through pharmacotherapy um, or 12 months out from bariatric surgery. And uh, they come in and they are randomized to either this mindfulness intervention or to kind of standard healthy lifestyle advice. 
eight weeks, group-based interventions once a week, um, they get weights done every week. And then the real outcome that we're looking at is six months later. So after the eight-week intervention, we leave them alone. They have Wi-Fi enabled scales. So we're able to see how often they're weighing themselves and get that data, um, okay. which I think will be interesting to look at. But really we're seeing is, was this mindfulness intervention effective at preventing weight regain six months out? Um, and so some of the things that are involved in this is there is a meditation component. Um, there's a savoring component. And by that, we mean getting people to focus on savoring natural rewards rather than food-based rewards or in the context of yeah. when it was used for drug and alcohol misuse rather than, you know, drug or alcohol um, based rewards. Um, and then also cognitive reappraisal. So helping people sort of shift their mindset from, uh, you know, potentially fatalistic or all or nothing thinking to more realistic approaches. Um, and so I'm excited to see where this goes. Um, I had done a small feasibility trial and I was at Colorado just to see would people be interested in this type of intervention. Um, and uh, that we had, you know, a small number of uh, women who did this and they loved it and they said they wanted to keep doing it and they wanted more. Um, and so this is sort of our next phase of that is to actually test it in a clinical trial. Wow, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there that I think is really impactful and really important for our listeners. The, the, the mindfulness piece alone, um, you know, Miles, this makes me think about the food that you create if people slowed down and had a mindful approach to the f creation of the food, and now it's not just about shoving massive quantities of food in there, but there's a mindful creation of food. What a beautiful thing that does. I, I've seen that with clients uh, and even myself over the years as I've become more present when I'm creating food. It's about the process of creation that is as rewarding as actually sitting down and eating that food. Um, but then I love how you talk about that the shift from food to as a reward to, or excuse me, from a, uh, food as a reward to, to some other reward and really being mindful and savoring the different moments. What, what are some things that as you're working with uh, people in this study that they're telling you that they're focused on savoring? Can you give us some examples? So they have, okay, it's not the ding dong or the Twinkie anymore. It's this. What is that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all over the place. A lot of people do use nature. Um, so even just like I was outside and I was really focused on the sound of the stream going by, or, um, you know, I have a, a granddaughter or grandson that I was watching and, um, you know, instead of, you know, having my phone out and kind of keeping an eye on them is, you know, I put my phone away, I put any other distractions, like maybe a snack or something away and I just like watched the joy in their face as I was like playing with the toy and they're giggling. Um, so it, it's a variety of things, you know, being with a pet, um, taking a walk, having like this feeling, you know, really like feeling the sun on your skin as you're outside. I mean, not today, obviously, <laughs> as it's been snowing and <laughs> overcast, but uh, more so, you know, in the summer and the fall. And so there's a variety of things that, you know, I think people are tuning into um, and that can sort of replace um, you know, a food-based reward or even replace like just a distraction. Um, cause we have a lot of those in our society. Um, and I think mm. we tend to be pretty overstimulated and at the same time, we're actually not very stimulated by any one thing. Um, and so this way we're just like, this is my one thing that I'm focused on and I enjoyed that moment. And yeah, that like stimulation seems stimulation. to be one hit stimulation too. Just these quick yeah. hits. Yeah. You know, you're sitting there and you're looking at a TikTok video or you're yeah. looking at Instagram as opposed to reading a really long novel and being yeah. satisfied reading that really long novel. Or even yeah. if you're watching television, watching a, a movie that's two, three hours long and you're absorbing it and you're, you're trying to get your dopamine through longer phases of things as opposed to these quick hits. Because once the quick hit is over and you don't have another quick hit, the next big quick hit yeah. is food. Yeah. 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 For a lot of people it is. And, and it's available, you know, that's the other challenges it's there and it's available in, you know, high calorie, highly palatable packages. Yeah. Well, I know, I know one's overeating apples, right? So <laughs> you know, no. it's not designed to help those. 
Yeah, never had a client come to me and say, oh, Steve, you, I, I, I fell off the wagon last night and I ate a whole bag of broccoli. Or, yeah. You know, I couldn't I stop eating the cauliflower. Yeah, I did have my mom once tell me that she got upset because she was just like eating carrots and not being mindful of it. And she ate a whole bag of like the baby <laughs> carrots. And I told her, well, it okay, could have been a whole bag of chips. Like it, you yeah. made a better choice. She was like, that's a good But point. at least she addressed the mindfulness part of she it. She did, yeah, yeah. That's good point. The, the, that's the most interesting. Like I wasn't being mindful about it. Yep. Savoring is a is a really powerful word to me because like Miles was just talking about to sit and read a book for a really long time. There's there's more than just this intake process. If I'm watching a TikTok and I get this hit from watching that TikTok and I might find it in entertaining or funny, I'm doing nothing. It's just boom, boom, boom. Something's happening inside of me. I read something recently that talked about that there's a major difference between intentional action that gives us a positive response versus something where we're passive. So if I'm reading a book, there's a visceral, there's an ethereal piece to that. Um, but I'm also moving my eyes. I'm I'm processing. So there are many layers to being able to savor something um, in life or like the lady that you were talking about that put the phone away. Do you find that a lot of people that are coming to you, whether it's for a study or people that maybe uh, you, you've coached before, that a lot of their overeating comes from that distracted behavior? Um, you know, we don't ask about that specifically, so I don't have any like real quantitative data on that. But in general, yes, people are commenting about, you know, one of the behaviors they're having to change is to intentionally like not bring, you know, chips or cookies with them when they're going to watch TV um, at night. Yeah. And so I think that does speak to that. I mean, do do a lot of that, um, you know, sort of automatic eating as we're engaged with something else. And um, then, you know, before we know it, we've eaten more than we intended to. So I think that is really common. Um, when uh, there was a study that was done kind of that asked, where does the time go when people exercise? Like that time has to come from somewhere. And it was from TV watching. It was people who um, you know, yeah. started an exercise program. One of the things that they gave up was watching as much TV in the evenings. And with that, obviously, the mindless snacking as well. Yeah, it's funny. I, I It's been a lot of years since I read this, but I, uh, somebody wrote an article. Uh, I don't know if it was based off of that study, um, because this is probably 20 plus years ago, where they said that the shift in caloric expenditure and, and or intake could be as much as five to 700 calories where you're taking away this sitting on the couch and eating a certain amount of calories. Maybe you're eating three, four or 500 calories, and then you can go burn a couple of hundred calories through exercise. So literally just going and exercising and not sitting on the couch eating, you, you could have this massive shift in the caloric balance uh, by making that one simple change. And yeah, people absolutely. just don't realize it, right? Yeah. And unfortunately the calories that we consume add up, uh, pretty quickly and <laughs> more quickly than we, you know, expend them through exercise generally too. So if you've got yeah. this shift where you've increased energy expenditure at the same time, you've stopped uh, a caloric intake bout, then yeah, your swing is pretty significant with potentially not that large of an actual change in behavior. Yeah, it literally could just be an hour change. I'm not going to spend time watching an hour of TV and I am going to spend time uh, working out, you may only burn a couple hundred calories during that time. If you're, if you're just doing mild exercise, right. But, um, that shift could be pretty significant. And that kind of leads me to the next question. Uh, we talked a little bit about the psychology and this idea that the mindfulness is an important play there. You mentioned the physiology, and I know we, we you were talking before we uh, got on here about that. There is a science behind it, as we said at the very beginning. There's a science to weight loss. There's a science to uh, really anything that has anything to do with our biology and the physiology. Caloric intake matters, right? And oftentimes, though, people don't understand how many calories they're consuming uh, while they're eating food, or they might not be as mindful. Can you talk a little bit about this physiological process that people need to go through in order to lose body fat? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the reality is, is that to lose weight and particularly body fat, although, you know, it's hard to only lose body fat. Generally, we are going to lose a little sure. bit of muscle as well, unless we're engaged in a lot of resistance training at the same time. 
um, you need to create a caloric deficit. And oftentimes, you know, people will come to us and they'll say, I'm only eating 1200 calories a day and I'm not losing weight. Uh, but then you start asking some more questions and you realize that they're nowhere close to 1200 calories, even though they may be thinking that they are. Um, yeah. And so this doesn't really address the physiology, but one exercise that I think everyone should do is weigh their food literally just for a week, because yeah. what you think a serving or not even weight, like just even measure it out. You don't need to go by a food scale. Um, but from, I did this bodybuilding and I also ran uh, controlled feeding studies where we do, we weigh out everything that we give to people. So we know exactly what they've consumed. And it is shocking the first time you weigh out a serving of peanut butter. It's heartbreaking, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, so it really is. People think yeah. that they're getting one serving, and they might get like three or four servings yes. in what looks like one serving. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So then when we're doing, you know, food recalls, and we start going into this, and even, you know, what kind of bread did you have? Um, because there's bread that's thin sliced and 45 calories sliced, and there's bread that's 150 mm. calories a slice, um, and yeah. so that difference is massive. Um, and so I really think truthfully, that's a great exercise for everyone to do. I'm not saying you need to do it your entire life. Um, but that could be a really important, impactful thing for people to realize the caloric content of their food, even, even healthy foods, um, that have a lot of calories. Um, but sort of, you know, back to the physiology. Yeah. The reality is, is that we do need to create a caloric deficit. Um, one of the challenges though, is as you start to lose weight, now the calories that you need to maintain that body weight have dropped down simply because our basal metabolic rate is pretty much a function of how much we weigh both our bone mass, our fat mass and our fat free mass. And so needing to recalibrate what your new maintenance weight is, um, is going to be important as well. Um, and then lastly, you know, there is certainly a genetic component to all of this. And while the estimates vary, you know, some people suggest up to 25, maybe up to 50% of body weight is predetermined by genes. Um, the reality is, is that that's very much true. And so you may be pre genetically predisposed to being at a higher body weight, but there are still things that you can do to lower that. Um, there was a recent study that came out that was in identical twins and they showed that the twin that exercised more had a lower body weight and a lower body fat than the twin who doesn't. So it's not, you know, your genes aren't necessarily your destiny um, when it comes yeah. to weight. I read that one. Gene expression was almost identical for, for both of them. Yep. And, and that was a, the lifestyle factor was huge. I want to go back to what you talked about earlier, because th there's a common misconception out there, or, or I guess it's phrased in a way that is, um, that probably leads to this misconception. People talk about, oh, well, when you, when you drop your calories, then you're going to slow your metabolism down. And that's not necessarily the case. As we lose body fat, as you mentioned before, the basal metabolic rate, which is a function of how much we weigh and what our tissue is, that goes down because of the weight loss. So yes, overall metabolic rate might be lower because you may be 10 pounds lower, but that doesn't mean that you have, uh, I've heard people say, well, you've crashed your metabolism. Well, that, that's just, <laughs> the science doesn't support that, right? So can you yeah. talk a little bit more about basal metabolic rate and, and, and how that changes as people lose weight? Yeah, certainly. So uh, basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate is really just the calories that your body needs to function and maintain its current weight. Um, and that accounts for the majority of our daily energy expenditure. We get about 10% um, energy expenditure from the food that we eat. And then the other component is really variable in just physical activity. Um, and so, yes, there is this, you know, my metabolism is wrecked mentality. And there is some rodent data that it seems somewhat supportive of that, that indicates that when you do, you know, lose a large amount of weight, your resting metabolic rate is reduced one, because you're at a lower body weight, but it also mm -hmm. seems to be shifted down a little bit. So it does appear particularly in rodent models that your resting metabolic rate decreases more than would be predicted based upon the weight loss alone. Um, and what's interesting is when you do these rodent studies, um, and I'm definitely not an expert in this, but, um, so if you, let's say you took a group of, uh, rats or mice and you had them gain weight and then you kept one group, um, 
at that body weight or continued to gain weight and you had one group that you weight reduced, um, once you allow them to eat ad libitum again, they go right back really quickly to that other group. Um, and when you look at the metabolic rate between them, it does seem to be shifted down. Um, and there's been some data supporting that in humans, but I will say it's really controversial topic. Um, you probably, sure. you know, talked about the biggest loser study before where um, it seems that people's metabolic rate is more reduced than would be predicted based upon that weight loss alone. Um, but I have colleagues at Colorado who have um, looked at this as well in pretty controlled retrospectively, they've looked back um, from pretty controlled trials and they don't see a persistent metabolic adaptation to weight loss. Um, and so I don't think that that's the one thing that people should be hanging their hats on as I, you know, I can't lose weight or predisposed to gaining more weight because my metabolic rate is crashed. Um, that's just not true. Does this have anything to do with the rate that you lose a lot of weight? Like somebody who loses weight gradually and slowly this idea of crashing your metabolism wouldn't happen as opposed to somebody who goes on some crazy diet and loses so much weight quickly. Does it apply to that at all? Or is it just a notion that doesn't exist, the whole idea of crashing your yeah. metabolism? That's a good question. I'm actually not sure if anyone's looked specifically at the rate at which was weight is lost and your resting metabolic rate or not, but perhaps that's been done. Um, it, interestingly, you know, I think we used to always recommend, oh, only lose about a half a pound to a pound a week because we want it to be gradual and we want it to be sustained. Uh, but that doesn't seem to necessarily be the case. There is more recent data that shows that getting weight off more quickly actually may be better and may help you to maintain it, uh, maintain that mm. weight loss longer. So I think the jury's still out on that one. Um, but if anyone's listening and <laughs> wants to tell me I'm yeah, wrong, I would love for them to email me any studies they're aware of. Yeah, I'd be fascinated. I it's it's interesting when you talk about this, um, you know, the weight loss and whether it's a downregulation or not. I, I have read that it does downregulate more than what is expected initially. Um, but early on in, in my career, I read some studies that said that if anywhere between six to 18 months, that the standard was about 18 months later, if you tested the same person's metabolism uh, or metabolic rate, whether you're testing RMR or BMR, um, 18 months later, for most people, they have completely, you know, reset what the expectation was. And depending on how much muscle mass uh, relative to their, uh, excuse me, lean mass relative to their fat mass is, uh, some people's metabolic rates are even higher uh, than what they were before, even at a lower weight. Um, so I remember the researchers saying that there was a, there, there's a lot to unpack there. They don't really understand the mechanisms. But I had a coach that I used to um, uh, read a lot of his stuff, and he would he would get people to a certain level and he said, look, if you can maintain it here for 18 months, you will be able to maintain this for uh, a really long time. And he, he was one of the most successful strength coaches in, in the history of the U.S., uh, created more Olympians, more professional athletes and saw great success with that. So I think from a I'd, I'd be curious for somebody to test that over time, uh, because from a clinical, you know, a clinician that's working in the field uh, saw some good results with that. But I, it, it's not really a you know, randomized double blind study that we've done on that. So I really would be fascinated. So I, we, we've talked a little bit about the psychology, a little bit about the physiology. I want to go to the lifestyle piece because at lifestyle you, you referenced earlier, especially in the US, we don't have a lifestyle that supports us being lean, fit and healthy. We have a lifestyle that is the antithesis of that. Um, talk about some of the most challenging lifestyle factors that you're seeing when you're uh, when you're having patients or clients come into you. Yeah, the, you know, I think it's the things that everyone sort of faces is, you know, long work hours, commuting, family responsibilities, food procurement, food preparation, household labor and maintenance, uh, all these things just really add up to one, us not having a lot of time available for exercise, mm -hmm. time available for cooking healthy meals. Um, so that's certainly part of it. And I think when you ask people what their biggest challenge is, they always tell you it's time. Now, yeah. is it really time or is it their perception of time? I think there's been a lot of behavioral researchers <laughs> who have backed it up and, and shown that it's actually truly really more of their perception of time than their time. Um, but I think the reality is like when we look there, are, you know, 
sure everyone has 24 hours in a day, but not everyone's 24 hours are the same. You know, if you have right. full-time child care, if you have, you know, the means for grocery delivery, um, <laughs> if you have, uh, you know, someone cleaning your house, you have more disposable hours in your day than someone who doesn't have those things. So I think that truly is, you know, kind of a disparity that we have and is part of why we see these um, socioeconomic and racial and ethnic differences in health and in body weight, particularly. Um, and that's pretty, pretty much what most people tell us is time. Um, you know, the other things is just social cues. Um, when you're, you know, with colleagues, when you're with friends, when you're with family, it's usually involving around food and sedentary, you know, activities. Um, and so that's really challenging to deal with because if you're all of a sudden trying to shift your behaviors and eat a little bit healthier, but you're, you know, your kind of normal traditions that you engage in are food centric, that's really challenging to say no to or to set boundaries on. And those are the two biggest things that people tell us about. Well, you have a 14 year old son who you get three days a week and then you shop for him and all his stuff is in your house when he leaves. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's, that's a, that's a third one. That's a great point. All his treats. <laughs> definitely worked with people who are like, I have teenage sons. It's like <laughs> they are, you know, like I cannot fill them up on kale. It's not happening. Um, uh, yeah. And so, you know, it's it really, you have to be creative and you have to create some types of systems that help you to create uh, boundaries and structure. So one woman that I worked with, I was at um, CU, she was in that exact same boat. Um, and so her solution was that she just created a cabinet in her kitchen and it was all of the kids' food is going in there. They're not allowed to keep it out on the table. They're not allowed to keep it out on the counter. And so I don't see it. And so it's, I'm not just going to pick it up and like have, you know, a few bites, which turns into a few more. Um, so it's, one, it's out of sight, out of mind. And then she was just really able to say, this is not mine and not go there. Yeah, um, yeah. I will say I do that in my own house um, because my general strategy is to not bring, you know, junk food or treat foods in. But when you live with someone who wants those things and seems to have better boundaries than I do with them, um, one thing I do is I write his name on it, right, Jason, on like the chocolate covered raisins. And for whatever reason that works. And he thinks it's hilarious that like that will get me from stop to eating his snacks, but it does. We have a little bit of a system that we try and sometimes we're successful and sometimes we fail at it. But the system is when he leaves my house, he takes his stuff with him. Yeah, there you go. No, that's a good idea. So it's out of here. And then when he comes over, he brings it from his mother's house. So this way we know Perfect. that there's three days that there's nothing in the house to distract yeah, us in terms yeah. of that types of food. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think what you said, uh, Tanya, when you when you understand what some people do have better uh, rate limiters, better barriers where they say, oh, I could eat one chocolate bar and I'm fine. Other people, if they eat one, they're eating 20. And so I, I understanding what that that trigger is for you. I think that's really important. I love what you're talking about with your colleague that has a, a different cupboard. So the way we do it in my house, because my son is 17 years old and we have all of these masculine energy coming into our house with like you know 10 20 boys coming over to work on their cars together and then they go to in the basement and they're playing pool and ping pong and they're you know yelling at each other and just all the teenage stuff and we've set it up to where all of their snack food because we're not really big snackers we we tend to eat our meals we we, we prepare them um and we try and eat really well um, but we're not big snackers, but but they are. My son and his friends, like this is just an age where I, I don't expect that he's going to eat the same meals we do and then he's going to be fine, right? I remember what it was like as a kid. So all of our snacks are in the basement, right by the pool table, right by the ping pong table. And so when the kids come over, they know if they want popcorn, they've got the, they've got the um, you know, they can pop the popcorn down there. They've got all the other snacks, whatever it is, it's like all right there. <laughs> And once or twice a week, um, when my wife goes to the store, she'll just restock that. And we just, we never, like, like we go down there, but it's like, that's Johnny's and, and we buy that for him and his friends. It's not ours. So there's really no temptation there. Um, so I think it's an important thing for people to understand that, hey, there, there are these social cues like you're talking about that we have to understand where our weak points are. At, because everybody has them. Everybody has those temptations. I mean, if, if my wife makes... Um, marshmallow brownies or she makes her oatmeal chocolate chip cookies there, there is no eating one of those it's like i eat the whole pan until i get yelled at to, to save some for someone else 
Um, so I have to, I have to have the boundary of it. It's not, it's not in the house. I, let, let's go back to time. You mentioned that time is probably the most uh, prevalent excuse. And time's a really fascinating thing. You know, I was lecturing to a group of leaders uh, about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And one of the concepts I teach is this concept of time, that it's different for everybody. Time is essentially, it's a relative construct in my mind where it's energy multiplied by your focus, right? So um, as you said, time is not the same for every single person. If we focus on something and we put energy to it, then we're able to accomplish certain things, right? So it's a relative construct of energy multiplied by focus. How are you working with people to find the time, carve out the time, manage the time, balance the time, whatever, whatever lexicon we want to use? What are you doing to coach people on managing their time to, to live a healthy lifestyle? Well, first of all, I love that. I just heard my pen drop. I was scribbling that down, energy, time, to focus. That was great. Um, yeah. So when, you know, when we're at the point where someone's in one of our research studies or previously when I worked in weight management at Colorado, people were already investing that time in themselves to come to the class. And so they're mm. at a better stage of like wanting to make this change than someone who hasn't figured out that they're going to do that and kind of invest in themselves. So in, in some ways we're getting people at a good moment. Um, and so I don't know if this is necessarily the case for anyone, um, but really shifting the mindset. And a lot of times this is women and they're used to being pretty selfless. And so shifting the mindset that if you're focusing on yourself, if you're taking time for yourself, that's not being selfish in some ways, that's actually by making yourself better that's going to make you a better mom. It's going to make you a better partner. It's going to make you a better friend. It's going to make you a better daughter, a better, whatever it is. And so that's really where I have to work on shifting that mentality of I'm being selfish by taking time for myself to know that you're, what you're doing for yourself is necessary. You need to put, you know, your oxygen mask on first before you help anyone else. And so you need, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. And so you need to take the time to fill your own cup up before you can give more to other people. And so that's, you know, part of the mindset that there that we have to work on. Um, And then there's certainly the logistics of like, okay, you work here, you live here. This gym seems to be right next to your work. Like maybe you, I know you like this gym over here, but it's 20 minutes away from both of those places. So it's probably, you know, you're not getting there for a variety of reasons. So it may be a very nice, they may have like, the equipment that you like, we can probably find one that's going to be more efficient and more effective for your life. Um, and so there's a lot of those logistic things as well, but I think the mindset is the best, uh, is the most important. Yeah. It's a, it's a psychological thing that you have to work into your lifestyle, right? It's, it's kind of like your money. I mean, it would, everybody, I, I, well, I don't know about you guys, but I would love to have a Ferrari and I don't have one. Um, yeah. but I could probably go out there and find a way to get a Ferrari And it just would mean that I would not have a lot of other things in my life. Maybe my kids, I wouldn't be able to feed them anymore. But, um, you know, time is like money. We can trade it for something, but we have to budget it in. We have to figure out, okay, like you're saying, don't go to the gym that's that's further away if your time is really limited. You mentioned something, I think, um, Miles and I have talked about that concept quite often over the years, that women in particular tend to feel a sense of guilt when it comes to investing in themselves. And I couldn't agree with you more that this, uh, this concept of you can't fill someone else's cup of yours is empty and you cannot give what you don't have. So if I don't have energy, if I don't have love of self, I can't give love to other people and I can't give them my energy. What do you, when you're sitting down with somebody and you're talking through this particular concept with a woman, what, what are you telling them? Um, you know, it's hard to just tell someone that because I think they need to kind of come to understand it on their own. So it's a lot of questioning, um, when you're doing this in the Mm. one-on-one environment, uh, well, you know, what would it mean if, you know, what you're saying is true? Like, what would it mean if you were selfish? Right. And like getting them to kind of go down that road. And then they kind of start to realize that they're not selfish, Um, But a lot of our current interventions we do, so we'll do either like one-on-one or group-based interventions. Our current intervention is group-based. And so I think that peer support is also really helpful because the reality is, is like if they're sitting across from me, they're like, you're young, you're thin, you've never had to deal with these things that I have to deal with. Um, You know, 
and I think it's helpful for them to hear these things from a peer as well and hear some of the successes that they've had and someone who's been in their shoes, who's, you know, had to lose weight, who's struggling to keep it off um, and navigating all of these different life things. Uh, so I think that that's a really powerful component is this peer and social support as well, rather than just someone being the expert sitting across from you telling you what you should be doing. Um, but I'm definitely not a psychologist. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I'm sure that people who work in, you know, a counseling, more of a counseling setting with people might have some better strategies there than I do. I like how you talked about deconstructing it though, because really when you have a belief that is very limiting, like, you know, I can't work out because it's a selfish thing. When you sit down and as soon as you start to deconstruct that, eventually you, you ask the questions and you peel the onion layer back to the point where I, I've seen this with clients in the past where the tears just start flowing because they say, well, I'm, I'm actually not selfish. And if I did this, I would be even less selfish because I can take care of my family more. Um, so we talked about psychology. We talked about the physiology. We've talked about the lifestyle. I want to come back to just some hunger and satiety questions. Um, because I think that that's a, that's a fascinating thing for people to, for people and, and something that they need to understand. Does what people eat matter when it comes to hang, hunger and satiety? Somewhat, it certainly does. Yeah. Um, you know, there are foods that are more satiating. So in general, protein, fiber, fat are going to be more satiating, uh, you know, components of food versus simple carbohydrates are. And so that's typically why you'll see, you know, when people are helping people coach through weight loss, they'll recommend increasing protein intake for the satiation component and also increasing fiber. So yes, it does. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's no one food that you're going to consume that's going to be better for you than another. And if we're talking about long-term weight loss, weight loss maintenance and long-term lifestyle change, you certainly need to include some of those more fun foods, even if they aren't super filling, super nutritious, um, because otherwise you'd probably be bored and you may be more likely to go off course as well if you're not incorporating those. Um, but definitely from, you know, an actual satiation value, protein and fat and fiber-based foods are going to be more satiating. Um, when I was uh, dieting for bodybuilding shows um, and I worked with some of the other people at my gym, um, just giving them some nutrition tips. Sometimes you'll see bodybuilders do this thing called if it fits your macros where, you know, they're given yeah, by their yeah. coach, you know, just eat this many grams of carbs, this many grams of protein, this many grams of, um, of uh, protein. But people don't usually give a fiber goal. So I would always give a fiber goal of like, you need to meet the basic fiber guidelines. So we're talking like 25, at least, you know, at least 25 grams of carbohydrate um, for your day. And that actually helps to sort of shift the choices to some more slightly more nutritious choices as well. And also helps to save off some of that hunger that's going to undoubtedly happen when you're trying to get that lean. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody's going on a weight loss plan and they're looking for uh, Im improved hunger or uh, excuse me, improved satiety signals, increasing protein, fat intake and fiber intake are going to be uh, crucial. I found that for myself as well. If I can increase my protein, fat and fiber, um, I, I tend not to be as hungry. If I'm sitting down and I'm just eating, you know, pure carbohydrates or carb carbon fat food together or even high sugar food, I tend to want more of them. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about this restrict and binge cycle? I know that we talked earlier that um, oftentimes what you're seeing is people are coming in, they're saying, I'm on a really low calorie diet. And some of that could be that they just don't, they're not tracking their calories uh, or they're misrepresenting the calories. But there is this common theme in um, weight management of I'm going to restrict and then I just binge. And maybe I restrict during the week and then I binge really big on the weekend. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening there? Yeah. So part of it is you're in a caloric deficit and maybe you're in too extreme of a caloric deficit. That's really not necessary for you to achieve your weight loss goals. And it's truly unsustainable. And so then you experience a situation, maybe it's, you know, a night out with some friends or it's just the weekend and you tend to take diet breaks over the weekend 
and you are hungry. And so you are not thinking straight. It's the end of a long week. So mentally you're sort of checked out and fried and you maybe are just operating sort of unconsciously. And then you could, you know, maybe you were on track to lose three pounds that week, but you have essentially ate that many extra calories over say the weekend. So by when Monday rolls around, you actually haven't lost any weight compared to the week before. And I think that is a common thing that we see. Um, and oftentimes I think it's, t people tend to say it's easier for them to restrict earlier in the day. Um, you know, it's easier mm. to, you know, say skip a breakfast or have a light breakfast, maybe work through lunch or just have something easy. Um, and while that could work for some people, I think for a lot of people, you get home and you're just ravished. And so while you're thinking about what you're going to make for dinner, you maybe eat 600 calories of snacks. Um, yeah. and so, you know, I think it, it did you raise hand raise? I like how your hand went up on that one, Miles. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, hey, I think we're all probably guilty of this at some point. Um, sure. And so I think in, in some of those instances, maybe working with clients one on one to be, hey, I know you're, you know, trying to be good all day, you know, quote unquote, good all day. But what if we just try, you know, shifting your lunch a little bit, like actually having lunch or having a bigger lunch, having a more protein filled lunch? And then let's see what happens when you get home, um, because that may be causing some of your issues. And so even though you might be fearful of doing that, the reality is it may actually save you some calories down the road and help you to stay on plan, stay on track. Yeah, great tip. I, I found for myself personally that if I if I start the day out with a really big uh, breakfast uh, at, at some point, I don't I don't eat right when I wake up, I tend to uh, go to the gym fairly early. And then my breakfast might not come around until about nine or 10 o'clock. And I, which is about four or five hours after I wake up yeah. um, and, or well, five or six hours. And, but at that point when I eat, it's a pretty big uh, yeah. breakfast and it, and it's primarily, you know, steak, potato, or excuse me, steak and, and eggs and maybe like some nuts. And so it's really high in proteins and fats and, and I'm good for a really long time. I rarely will come home at the end of the day and say, well, I'm really hungry. I typically will eat some other food during, during the day, but I just don't have those cravings uh, like I used to. If I started the day out in a different way, or, or like you're saying before, I didn't eat anything and then I came home, uh, I, I might fall off the wagon. Y you mentioned that with this drop in calories during the week, and then sometimes people go on the weekend and they go higher, that they're getting a, uh, a weekly, you know, that their weekly calories or the weight might go up because their weekly calories are, are um, higher than, and they're not in de a deficit anymore. When, when you're coaching people, do you have them uh, track daily calories? Do you have them track weekly calories? How do you do that? And I think it depends upon the individual and their goals. Um, so certainly when I was working with some bodybuilders, I mean, that's daily, you're weighing out all of your food. It's down to the gram of everything um, because you need to do that to hit your, your, you know, your show weight and your goals. Um, for other people, they can find that tracking to be pretty challenging and pretty onerous and pretty time consuming. Um, so I think for some of them, it's better to actually just create more of a structure of it's less about, you know, I don't care if it was a banana that you ate or an apple, but maybe let's plan like your breakfast is this set meal. And you basically just kind of have the same thing every day. And your lunch is kind of sort of the same thing. Like even if it is, you know, maybe like a pre-prepared, um, you know, meal or even just leftovers from the dinner before, it's pretty similar looking like you've got a grain, you've got a, you know, a, a meat or an ant, you know, a protein source, and you've got some like non-starch vegetables. And then you don't really have to worry so much about the tracking um, of calories because you know, you're going to be pretty consistent from day to day. Uh, so it really, I think varies depending upon the person. And, you know, some people find a lot of success with doing like a time restricted feeding approach where maybe yeah. they're limiting yeah. their meals to eight hours a day. And then they, you know, because they've shortened that eating window so much, the chances for them overeating within that window are pretty small. And that's great. Um, you know, some people want to follow more of a keto plan and that's great. Like I, I really am not anti any approach. Well, I get, I'm anti some crazy approaches. Like if all you're eating is like some crazy juice all, you know, for a, a right. week straight, but, yeah. um, you know, in terms of like getting, you know, nutritious meals in whether you want to, you know, 
calorie count, whether you want to count macros, uh, you want to do a Weight Watcher, now that's called WW, you know, formerly Weight Watchers, you want to track on an app or Noom, that's great. You want to just do time-restricted eating or alternate day fasting, have at it, you know, whatever is going to work for you. And maybe you'll find that you need to switch up your strategy. Maybe you had a strategy that was working super effective and you notice you're kind of slipping. It's not really, work, you're not really adherent to it anymore. So maybe you switch it up and you try something new. Um, and I, I love that you. advice. Yeah, because there really isn't one strategy that's better than another, right? I mean, no, no. ultimately, if it works for you, do that. I, yeah. I, it's funny because I had a conversation with somebody recently. They're like, well, what about this strategy? What about this strategy? I finally looked at him and said, how much weight do you want to lose? Well, I, I need to lose 50 pounds. Okay, so what do you want to do? Well, I want to know what the most optimal way is. I'm like, you're 50 pounds overweight. There's the optimal is to get the 50 pounds off. Yeah. So what can you stick with, right? It, you, you look at, uh, uh, what's his name? James Clear's book. Uh, Atomic Power Habits. of Habits? Atomic yeah. Habits, thank you. Yeah, and and it, it, it's really just like, what's the habit that you can do? If it's the habit that you can do, whether it's time-restricted eating or keto or whatever it is, and that gets you to the end result, what, what a great way to go. Do you, have you ever seen on Instagram, I think he calls himself the fitness chef, have you seen his account? Oh, I haven't, but I'll have to check it out. So it, he, he really posts some fascinating stuff. I think what I love most about him is he, the way he jokes around. It's like one of these accounts where you never see him talk. He just kind of acts things out. And then he like points okay. at the, you know, the whole TikTok thing, like I'm pointing at, at whatever it says. But he really mocks this, this whole idea of that you have to do it one way. And he'll oftentimes put up these side-by-side -side comparisons and say, I had a really bad day. And then I was really good this day. And he'll, he'll put out the caloric intake and the, and the fats and the sugars between those two and just debunk this whole concept of like that, that there is good and bad in this. And, and that if we break it down to what is, then we're going to find a much better way to live by looking at the science of it and, and, and really probably not being too hard on ourselves. Um, Tanya, one thing that just keeps coming up, I think that, that uh, I get asked this question from time to time is relative to hunger and satiety, how does alcohol play into this? Um, and, and let me, let me kind of phrase it up like this. I've had clients in the past that say, well, I like to intermittent fast on the weekends. And then I go out with friends and then it starts out with the drinks and then everything just goes to hell in a handbasket and I eat uh, an entire cow. So um, how, how does alcohol play into the hunger satiety piece? Yeah, that's a, a super common. Uh, and it really has to do with this concept called disinhibition because obviously okay. when you, you know, have uh, consumed, you know, more alcohol than to just get a slight buzz, your, your disinhibition is, is, you know, a lot higher. So you're more likely to engage in other behaviors that you normally wouldn't. And a lot of times uh, food consumption comes along with that um, in part because of, you know, the alcohol, but in part because you're probably staying up later. And we know that late night eating or, you know, when you, when you're restricting your sleep, so when you're staying up later, you tend to eat more, you tend to eat more highly caloric foods. Um, and that concept yeah. of disinhibition is something that we actually will measure. We have a couple of different surveys that have been validated that we'll use to look at this. And um, we have found um, so that people who report higher levels of disinhibition, they are more likely to gain weight over time. Um, we did this one study in Colorado where we recruited people who classified themselves as being either obese prone or obese resistant. And that was just based basically on their self-report um, of like, I have to work to maintain my weight. And they were all pretty normal weight to start with. And we followed them for five years. Um, and we found that people who at baseline five years previously said that they had higher level, or, you know, this, the, the survey that they did um, indicate they had higher levels of disinhibition. They were more likely to gain weight over that five-year period than those who had lower levels of disinhibition. Um, so I think it is wow. a construct that may be kind of stable within a human um, and may indicative, you know, maybe indicative of your uh, predisposition to weight gain or not. So what you're saying is my disinhibition relative to the brownies and the cookies. Yes. Yeah is what it will cause me to be obese 20 years from now. 
which is why you have these strategies in place of, you know, your wife doesn't make them all the time. And exactly, you know, it's like, it can't be around all the time and that's fine. No. And that's, I think that's <laughs> all we all have to figure out what our things are and, you know, uh, make some tweaks accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few final questions for you. We're coming up on our time here. Um, so I'm really curious, what is it that you know that you wish other people knew? Good question. Um, you know, well, I definitely, you know, my, my goal is really to help people become healthier. And a lot of that does incorporate weight loss or improved diet or improved physical activity. Um, I also do want people to know that there's a lot beyond, you know, just diet and exercise that goes into weight. And we sort of touched on that um, with, you know, yep. sort of some genetic predisposition earlier. Um, but the other thing is just more broadly for people to be a little bit more empathetic to everyone, because you don't actually know when you look at someone, what their history is and what, you know, that person that you're looking at and seeing as being overweight or obese they may have already lost 40, 50 pounds. Like they may have already done quite a lot to improve their health. Um, and so I think that's something that as I've sort of matured as a practitioner and a researcher that I've come to understand is that people have a lot of challenges that you don't know just by looking at them. And um, so just being a little bit more empathetic and compassionate about people who are dealing with weight related challenges, um, I think is, is huge and, and something I've come to understand. Um, and it's helped me to, you know, uh, a lot of healthcare professionals, dietitians, including actually have a lot of weight bias and weight stigma. And mm. unfortunately people in larger bodies, they, as a result of this, they tend to get worse medical care and they, uh, you know, they might come in cause they've got a cold and all of a sudden the doctor's harping that about them on their weight. And they're like, I just, you know, could I get something for my throat? Um, or, you know, whatever it is, or people go misdiagnosed with, um, you know, cancer because they assume it's a weight related issue and they don't do all the diagnostic tests or whatever it might be. Interesting. Um, so I think that's, you know, something I would like people to more people to know is that, you know, you can't tell someone's health by their weight. Well, certainly, you know, excess adiposity is strongly linked to a lot of health outcomes. Um, you can't say for certain that that person is any more unhealthy than the person in a thinner body. Yeah. Great point. So, yeah, I mean, encouragement costs nothing, right? So yeah. to encourage somebody and to stay open uh, to, uh, to, to that person, just who they are. I, I, I love that. Um, what, Tanya, what are you most proud of right now? Uh, right now, I am most proud of my students. I have a fantastic team of graduate students that uh, I get to work with every day at the University of Utah, and they are just outstanding. They are hardworking. Um, they are super intelligent, and they are really kind people. They're curious. They're passionate. And they're all going to go on to do great things. Um, you know, they've already had a lot of successes in getting some of their own uh, funding for their doctoral work they've presented at national international meetings um and so i take a lot of pride in seeing them succeed that's exciting what I, and, and uh you gotta you gotta pass this podcast on to them so that they can hear you praising them that's exciting <laughs> I will, yeah um, Tanya, last question for you. So at Evolve, we believe that, uh, you know, change happens over time and that people evolve over time by stacking one simple habit on top of another. If there were one habit that you would like our listeners to start on right now, what would it be? Well, we didn't talk about this a ton, but resistance exercise, because mm. I really think that resistance training is like kind of the gateway exercise. It's gonna help increase lean mass, which is super important for health. It's super important for aging populations, helps um, you know with activities of daily living. And I did a, a study when I was a doc student where I asked the question, do people who engage in resistance training, does that lead them to other health behaviors? And what we saw was that people, these were older adults with prediabetes, um, with a resistance training program, they engaged in more non-resistance exercise physical activities. So they were walking more and they decreased caloric intake and carbohydrate intake. And so it seemed to be like wow. that this one change, this one habit um, that they engaged in, you know, intentionally or not resulted in some other successful habits. So I'm all about team strength training. 
That's awesome. I'm with you there. I found that strength training is probably the most impactful thing in my life. If I strength train in the morning, like I normally do, everything else is so much better. So I absolutely love that tip. Well, Tanya, I feel like we've really just scratched the surface. We're going to have to uh, pick a time to have you come back on because there is so much more in that brain that I can just tell is ready to come out. But um, I, I want to thank you for uh, coming on and uh, sharing your wisdom with uh, with us and with our listeners today. Um, and on that note, folks, it is time for us to wrap up another episode of the Evolve Podcast. I want to thank our guest, Tanya Halliday, for coming on and joining us today. And my co-host, W. Miles Riley, who you have not heard for a few minutes because something happened and his internet dropped. So <laughs> he was just texting me and we lost him there. But uh, uh, we, we hope everything works out well there for Miles. Uh, Tanya, you are a wealth of knowledge. What is the best way for people to uh, interact with you, ask you questions, follow your journey? What, what, how do you want people to get in touch with you? Yeah, I use that Twitter a lot for uh, sort of sharing scientific information as well as just kind of general fun things about my life. Um, and my handle is uh, at nutrition nerd. Um, and I have the same, uh, same handle on Instagram, although it's pretty much just photos of my dogs on Instagram, <laughs> not so much any <laughs> nutrition stuff. I think I've, I've got to follow you on Twitter. I follow you on Instagram. I, they, it was the nutrition nerd moniker that uh, made me follow you. I, yeah. I think I mentioned this before in people's uh, or in, in another episode where if something pops up and it's, it's a name or it's a post that I find interesting, I'll just follow that person and then just see what they post over time to see if they're interesting enough to reach out and say, Hey, come on the podcast. And I just love your, I love the name of it. And I think you post uh, some great stuff. You're a pretty active person. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will put links to your Twitter and to your Instagram account in our uh, show notes so people can get a hold of you. And Hey folks, remember that it does take time and consistency to evolve, but first you have to disrupt. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve. Thank you for listening to the Evolve Podcast. If you like this episode, share it with your friends. Follow us on Instagram at evolve underscore cast and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcasting app. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve.